time. It's, uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Matt Stuber. Uh, uh, Matt has uh, got his uh, bachelor's at uh, Minnesota and PhD at MIT. After that, he uh, moved on to become an entrepreneur. Uh, he's the co-founder of uh, Water Effects, right? Yeah, that's right. And, uh, uh, which uh, focuses on uh, energy and water and uh, desalination techniques and so on. I think his uh, uh, talk today is going to be focused mainly on what he's doing and what uh, are the issues, activities of, uh, of uh, what after uh, he graduated from MIT. Um, he lives in Massachusetts and he's uh, obviously a robust design uh, person, so he's considered for our position on uh, robust design of uh, physical systems. Uh, in uh, uh, addition to that, uh, uh, Matt, during his, we overlapped in during my short stay at MIT uh, briefly. Uh, his work was uh, on bi-level optimization, semi-infinite programs, and uh, solutions of uh, um, best work case, worst case scenarios, or uh, generally speaking, uh, robust design problems. At that point, he was working with, uh, on a Chevron project. I think. Yeah, Chevron. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's all I have to say. I'll say yeah. to Thanks, time. George. Thanks. Thank you very much for being here. So, yeah, Can thank you. Turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I better do that. <laughs> so um, thanks for the intro, and uh, of course, thanks to the faculty for, for inviting me to, to be able to give the seminar, um, and thanks for, for attending. Um, this is, yeah, really the work that I've been doing since my PhD work, so it's been from about 2012 to today. Um, in this specific talk, I will be talking about the kind of the, the, the process that I've been focusing on, and the integration, and then, of course, uh, applying robust design methodology, but from more of an economics perspective. So how do you enable business, uh, a business case uh, in this space? So robust design for a sustainable future, solar desalination for food and water security. So the, the outline, I'm going to give you the, the introduction and the motivation to the problem, um, kind of what I've been focusing on and, and what makes it so challenging uh, I'll move into the process design and modeling of a solution, so the solution that I propose to this, this problem. I'll switch gears a bit and do the, you know, go into the mathematics, so the, I'll, I'll formulate the problem um, and, and represent it uh, in a formal way for robust optimization, semi-infinite programming, and uh, I'll give you the background and the relevance. You can really see how the application works here. Then um, I'll discuss the solution results, and, and that'll be it. So I'm really focusing on California right now um, for a number of reasons. Well, first, California is home to the most productive agricultural region in the United States. Uh, the most recent crop report pegs California agriculture at a $54 billion in revenue generated per year. Uh, so it's quite substantial. Uh, California is the primary source to much of the nation's fruits and vegetables. Um, in particular, one that I find amazing, maybe because they're one of my favorite snacks, is 99% of the nation's supply of raisins comes from Fresno County alone. So one county in Central Valley of California gives nearly 100% of the nation's supply of raisins. And when we're talking about export, if you travel anywhere in the world, 50% of the world's supply of raisins it comes from this one county in California, which is, is, is just substantial. Um, another interesting statistic is that 79% of all of the human-used water goes to agriculture. So it's not L.A., it's not San Francisco, it's raisins and almonds. Uh, if you've been following the news, you know California is an unprecedented drought. Actually, we're in the worst drought in 1,200 years. So we go all the way back to tree rings, um, and we realize that, that this is quite a substantial um, environmental uh, issue that we're facing. Uh, this is the drought map over the last few years. I clipped 2013 because it's, uh, um, well, too wide. But what you see is, you know, there was some drought relief over this last winter, which was because of El Nino. We, we actually had snowpack in Sierra Nevada. Uh, however, there's not a whole lot of drought relief in the south of the Delta region. So this is, this is kind of where we draw the line between north and south of the Delta. South of the Delta, um, this is the Delta. The south region is still in this extraordinary and exceptional drought, and um, it also happens to be the home of all of this agriculture. So we're still in this, in this massive uh, um, drought condition. 
Another problem that's not really uh, publicized all that much is this idea of salt imbalance, accumulation in the region. Um, this is actually a common problem in agriculture, especially where you have uh, certain types of soils. This is the primary cause of the fall of ancient Mesopotamia, and we actually continue to repeat this issue throughout history. And what it is, is whenever you're irrigating, you're bringing in uh, essentially a foreign water source so that you can grow crops in an environment that otherwise would not sustain the crop growth. Um, when you import that foreign water, you bring in uh, all kinds of uh, impurities, and that's fine for the crops in the moment. However, uh, because of the large quantities of water that we're actually dealing with and, uh, and you know, the, the actual capacity of, of crops that we're, we're growing, uh, we end up accumulating a massive amount of salt uh, in the soils. So this, the water gets imported, the crops suck up the water, um, some of the water evaporates, and the salts remain behind. And they really remain behind um, because of the specific soil conditions, don't allow for the salts to drain away naturally. So what we do is we implement this, this uh, managed drainage. We have these engineered systems where we essentially uh, lay a pipe under the, under the root zone of the crops, when we water the crops, they dissolve all of that salt, they drain down into that, that pipe, and then we can um, you know, drain that out somewhere. So this is a managed drainage system. This happens in uh, a number of agricultural regions. However, the outfall of this is essentially an aqueduct system of wastewater. So it's a salty wastewater that would otherwise, uh, otherwise poison the soil so crops can't grow there. And now what you're left with is, a, is a, a, a massive waste problem. So um, the last report, the last report estimating this, uh, uh, this accumulation issue said 275 tons an hour gets deposited uh, in this region alone. So it's, a, it's <laughs> not a small quantity of salt that we're dealing with. Uh, and this includes many materials that are classified as, ha as hazardous. Again, these unique soil conditions make groundwater very shallow, so um, the, the, the salt water actually saturates the crop root zones. Um, it, it dissolves the, the salts that were embedded in the soil uh, from previous operations, uh, and it's very toxic to crops, so it, it really begins to impair productivity. By 2030, literature estimates that 15% of the arable land will need to be retired. So this is a massive problem for the state. Uh, and on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley, uh, where we're really focusing, basically on the west side of where all those raisins and almonds grow, um, we're talking 40% of the land. Uh, so this is, this is a serious economic uh, issue. So a quick summary of the, of, the, of the challenge. Well, first, we have an, a limited and unreliable water supply. So drought is just, one, is just one thing. We don't have a lot of water. So there's a value on water. Um, this is climate change-driven drought, and uh, economic and population growth you know, puts, an, puts a, a burden on the, on the water supply. Um, irrigation causes salt accumulation in the soil. This is a longstanding problem. This impairs the soil. It's environmentally hazardous and reduces productivity. Uh, and then lastly, soil salinity control, kind of the status quo, um, produces extraordinarily qu extraordinary quantities of salt water. So it's a massive, a massive waste problem. The so system looks like this. Um, we essentially have uh, energy input here. We have some water and impurities. We have some chemistry uh, for crop health. Uh, it all gets fed into our agriculture. <laughs> we produce a product. Uh, our high-value products here, the raisins and almonds, for instance, uh, biomass, which also has a, a quite high value in industry, uh, in, in, in this industry, and then a whole bunch of waste. Um, I'm, I'm just showing here that we have some massive salt um, uh, increasing, it's accumulating, and uh, this hurts our efficiency. So efficiency is going down with time. So what I'm proposing is why can't we just take that salt water, uh, we treat it, sequester the salts, and create a freshwater product that's high value, especially in times of drought, but also it's an environmental, environmental mitigation uh, problem. So the, the objective of a solution is to treat the saline wastewater to very high recovery, uh, sequester those salts, return the fresh water. Um, this will increase the overall water use efficiency of the sector. 
It will reduce and eventually eliminate the salt accumulation problem. So if you can implement this in a, in a, broad, enough, um, in a broad enough way, you can actually uh, make the irrigation, uh, the, the salt accumulation problem sustainable. And uh, this will increase the production efficiency of the land through su sustainable drainage management. So what they're doing now is not working, and they're essentially retiring land and, uh, as it becomes more and more poisoned. So my criteria and constraints for, for what the design has to meet are shown here. Uh, flexibility, of course, that's important in many processes. In this case, it needs to be flexible to vary in feed quality and chemistry. We really don't know uh, the specifics of what, the, what that wastewater looks like. It can be uh, a, number of, a number of various impurities in it, uh, and it varies throughout the year. It might vary from as little as uh, 1,000 parts per million in one time of the year to 30,000 or 40,000 parts per million another time of the year, which is more than, salt, uh, more than seawater. We have an emphasis on reducing our dependence on fossil fuels and grid power. So the whole idea here is to make agriculture more sustainable. By implementing a process that is a major energy consumer, um, if you don't do that in a renewable fashion, you're you know, not really solving the overall, the overall problem. And uh, again, to sequester the salts, we need to focus on near zero to zero liquid discharge with solids recovery. So we're not going to be you know, depositing any more of this back into the environment. The basis for the design is an age-old technology that, that, that I'm going to be considering. It's multi-effect distillation. Um, multi-effect distillation is essentially a train of individual distillation chambers. Um, and it works in a really efficient manner. Um, it tends to be more capital intensive than, for instance, uh, uh, RO or, or membrane treatment. However, it meets all of the previous, uh, meets all of the previous criteria for flexibility uh, and robustness. So MED works in this, in this way. We basically feed in a, our brine into our first distillation stage, which is on the left. Our last distillation stage is here on the right. Um, the salt water enters this first stage. We add an energy source. In this case, it's steam. And we boil the salt water. The salts are non-volatile, so they remain behind in the liquid phase, which is down here. And we produce uh, steam, which is our freshwater product in the form of, in the, you know, in the gaseous state. So the steam carries a, a, quite a lot of energy. The, the latent heat of steam is massive, right? Uh, we're always told from our earliest engineering education is that the, the dumbest thing you can do is boil water. Um, but <laughs> in this, in this uh, system, we actually do it really efficiently because... What we do with that steam is actually send it to the next stage, capture its latent heat um, as it condenses, and we produce our freshwater product. And we've essentially taken the latent heat in this steam, and we recycle it time and time again for every, every uh, next stage. So the vapor that's boiled here condenses in this, releases its energy, uh, boils more salt water. Again, the steam is produced here and moves forward in that fashion. Uh, also, as the brine is uh, as the brine uh, is boiling in this stage, it becomes more concentrated, and we actually send it forward to the next stage, and it becomes more concentrated. So it's really neat. As the brine gets pushed forward for every stage, we're recycling the latent heat uh, from the steam from the previous stage to boil more of the salt water in the subsequent stage. So this just goes on in a sequential fashion until you get to the very end, where you're producing a very, very highly concentrated brine. Crystallization is happening. And, um, and you've recycled the latent heat of steam uh, for as many times as you have uh, stages. So what do you do at the last stage? You can't recycle it in the, in the, the you can't recycle that latent heat in the, um, in the normal way because there's no stage to follow it. And uh, what you do is you implement this thing, which is a condenser. And the condenser just takes the, the the steam turns it into the liquid state um, by cooling it with some cooling water. And that cooling water is essentially just rejecting all of that energy to the environment. So that's not great because, again, the latent heat of steam is a lot. It just so happens that uh, at this last stage, it exists at lower temperature and pressure. So it's considered to be very low quality. Um, in some industries, that's fine. We just reject it because our main, our main value is the water. Um, However, it's a major source of inefficiency. 
So it's not surprising that this is the single greatest source of entropy generation. It's really been the focus of, of, of my research on the, on the MED system and, and the incorporation of renewable energy. So the first strategy for eliminating or, or shrinking the, the condenser needs um, and making the overall process more efficient is to consider some, court, some kind of a mechanical uh, recompression device. So you take the low-pressure steam in this case. Uh, you might send it to a mechanical vapor compressor where you're adding a whole lot of uh, shaft work and you're taking the uh, low-pressure steam and pumping up its conditions to high pressure and temperature. And now it's at high enough quality that you can actually drive the whole process. Um, so this is, a, this is a, common, a common way to do it. Um, however, compressors are quite limited in size for these types of engineering systems. Uh, they're super expensive, and they require a lot of electricity. So from a thermodynamics perspective, it's very efficient. But from a capital uh, perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's not ideal. The other way to do it with a mechanical system is a steam jet ejector. Uh, which is sometimes called a, a thermal, vapor, uh, thermal vapor compressor. And instead of adding uh, shaft work or electricity, you have a high-pressure motive steam source. The high-pressure steam enters a nozzle. Uh, it gets accelerated through that nozzle to supersonic uh, velocities, and it creates a vacuum point that sucks in low-pressure steam. And then it blends with the high-pressure steam, and what you get out the other end is an intermediate pressure and temperature. And that's at a high enough condition to power the overall process. Uh, steam jet ejectors, they're not terribly efficient, but there's no moving parts. They're extremely, uh, extremely inexpensive, and they're really easy to operate. So that's a very common thing to implement in industry. The challenge with it is that you actually need a, a source of high-pressure steam to make it work. As a chemical engineer, I focus on this problem a little bit differently. Um, again, we were always told boiling water is stupid and compressing gases is stupid. So um, <laughs> what do we do if those are bad ideas? So what I did was approach this problem um, through uh, how, do we change the, how do we change the low pressure steam into a liquid uh, and be able to, to boost its conditions uh, from the liquid phase. So I implemented a absorption desorption process. So in the absorber, we have, uh, we have some kind of an absorbent liquid. And when the steam enters the absorber, it prefers to be in the, the liquid state uh, in that environment. It gets absorbed by that liquid. And it's extremely exothermic. So it releases its latent heat um, actually at a temperature that's quite high. So the low-pressure steam comes out the back end, enters the absorber. Um, now it's a liquid at high temperature, low pressure. We send it through a liquid pump, which is almost free. They're very, very cheap and require very little energy to, uh, to uh, pump liquids. And we pump that liquid up to a high pressure, and it goes into this desorber chamber. In the desorber, it's a liquid phase, and it's at high temperature and high pressure. And now all we need to do is uh, turn it back into steam. The way we do that is we add heat at just the right temperature, and we produce, a, we produce a steam vapor that's at the right conditions to drive the overall process. So it's really neat. It's a really efficient way to put steam into a liquid phase, pump up its pressure um, and temperature through this process, and now we have just an ambiguous energy source that we need. It can come from a number of different sources. Honestly, I don't care. Uh, it just has to be at the right temperature. Uh, I did implement this, this process in California as a pilot, and uh, what I'm going to be doing here is talking about the modeling and the robust design of, of a commercial system. The commercial system will consider a 10-effect MED, so there's 10 of these distillation chambers. So we're essentially recycling the latent heat of steam 10 times, um, and I'll be doing heat integration uh, with the vapor absorption and desorption process, um, as well as some, uh, there's some waste heat that's produced uh, in the middle of each one of these stages that I'm, I'm capturing through uh, some heat exchange. So, like I said, we need an ambiguous heat source. just has to be at the right temperature. And I have an emphasis on renewables. So for this project, I considered concentrated solar thermal. Concentrated solar thermal is usually, uh, you know, was historically applied for power generation. However, we're seeing a, kind of a rebirth for process heat applications. 
And uh, my process, because of the, that absorption-desorption uh, system, my process is now so efficient that uh, I can apply what's typically regarded as very expensive uh, solar technology. I can now apply that to something that you know is is typically um, considered not a high priority, and that's water. So for this uh, for this system, I'm considering a single axis tracking large aperture parabolic trough. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially it's just a huge mirror that's in the shape of a parabola, um, and it has a focal it has a focal line. Uh, that flows a heat transfer fluid. So uh, any of the sun's rays that are incident on the mirror all get focused and concentrated on that focal line. And in that focal line, I have a heat transfer fluid, um, and I'm essentially just capturing all of the sun's energy. Uh, when I say all of, I, I only mean, of course, the efficiency <laughs> that, uh, that this allows. And uh, for, solar, for concentrated solar thermal applications, the efficiency is actually quite high. For a large aperture trough that I'm considering here, uh, the efficiency comes out to about 75% um, on average. Some of that efficiency is due to the vacuum tube receiver. So once the energy enters the receiver, uh, it's actually not being lost to the environment. Um, some of it comes from the orientation. It's a north-south orientation, and it tracks the, tracks the sun in one axis. So as the sun rises in the east and goes to the west, the, the whole uh, parabola actually flips over. Uh, to, to model the performance of this system, so I have a full model of the, the characteristics of the parabolic trough. Now I need solar resource data. I'm getting my solar resource data from the NREL database. So um, they have a lot of satellites and weather stations. Um, so all of this data is really open access, and anyone can, can make use of it. Uh, I punch in my specific coordinates, and then what I get out are... Uh, a large data set in the form of the 8760 hour per year. So it's it's a, a, a what they call a typical meteorological year, um, and you have 8760 data points, one for every hour of that representative year. For this region, the, the solar performance looks like this. Um, you can see, you know, in the summer months it's extraordinary. However, in the winter months, it's only about a third of what it is in the summer. That's um, that's not ideal, uh, but considering how amazing the solar performance is in the summer, uh, is actually lead to really uh, amazing conditions. So the overall process looks like this. We have the, the essentially the power block here in purple. This is a heat transfer fluid, fluid flowing through the power block. The uh, primary uh, energy source is the concentrated solar thermal. We have... Uh, Thermal storage, just for, for buffering and off-peak usage. And then we have an auxiliary heat source. This auxiliary heat source is essentially just a furnace um, that's fired by fossil sources or if you have an adjacent uh, energy source. But in this case, it's natural gas. Now, um, the reason we have that is because sometimes there just isn't any sun and you need to operate, uh, you need to operate the process. All of that powers the absorption-desorption process, which I'm calling heat pump here. And, um, and that powers the, the MED system, the distillation system, where we take in salt water, we produce fresh water, and a brine and salt reject. Um, here's just an aerial view of, of a Google SketchUp of what this looks like in the actual region. This is about a 25-acre installation, and it produces about 2 million gallons a day. So um, just to, to, to give you a visual on what a, the, the large aperture systems are. My pilot plant that I have installed right here, which you can't see because Google didn't update, um, is one of these parabolas. It's about a half a megawatt. So now I'm going to move into the mathematical problem formulation. We're really going to discuss, um, really going to discuss what's at stake here, what, how I'm going to propose applying this system to solve the water and salt challenges. So without a solution, I'm going to be considering that we retire 10% of the growing region by 2035 simply due to salt impairment. This is conservative. Before I said 40% of this region uh, by 2030 is going to be retired. What we want to do is sustain, uh, continue irrigation and operate the agribusiness. Farmers are not happy about you know, going bankrupt and moving their family to San Francisco. Um, <coughs> Desalination for drainage reuse. So that's what I'm proposing. We take the wastewater, we desalinate it, we produce fresh water. 
This will help prevent the growing region retirement, the, the salt impairment issue. This will reduce the water footprint of agriculture. So this is massive. Um, this will generate a new income source for growers. So now we're, they're becoming water producers instead of just water takers. And uh, lastly, this also increases the water for municipal use. So when allocations are very tight, of course, human direct consumption in municipal fashion is, is, is the priority. So for this region, I'm going to desalinate all the available drainage water, all the wastewater. This region is about 100,000 acres, and every year they produce 22,500 acre feet. Uh, acre feet are what you need to talk to farmers with. <laughs> Those are units of volume. <laughs> um, this is equivalent to about 28 million cubic meters. It's a, it's a massive volume. Every acre foot is about uh, 325, 326,000 gallons. So it, it's, it's large. It's what happens when you take an acre of land and you flood it one foot deep. Uh, a normal acre of like, kind of the average crop an acre of crops will take about two feet of water over the whole year. So 2.2 acre feet is about 650,000 gallons a year to grow an acre of tomatoes, for instance. Uh, I'm going to consider fixed inflation on food and ag revenues and energy pricing. Uh, I'll have debt financing, so it's, I'm going to amortize this project over 10 years, and I have a 20-year project lifetime. And I'm considering optimal design of the solar field and storage uh, for offsetting natural gas. So the idea is that we have a fixed capacity of water. We've already optimized the process. Uh, however, now it's all coming down to energy. How do we make the economics work with renewable energy? Because there's a land value at, at stake here. I have uncertainty in my water market rates. So what I'm selling my water at, who's going to pay what for it? Uh, and then I have uncertainty in natural gas pricing. So I don't, I don't know what, what the natural gas prices are going to be doing. But I have some idea. So in the robust optimization um, uh, methodology, or, or applying kind of the worst case feasibility for this project, this is the logical constraint that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to address. So what I'm seeking to find is that for all of the market conditions, uh, can I find a design so that the project is economically viable. So it's that easy. There's, there's a whole bunch of uncertainty um, in, in what the economics are today for the water and for the gas. Um, and what I need to do is I need to come up with a design that's robust to those conditions uh, so that I can go to the bank and say, don't worry, that you know, this isn't as high risk as you might think it is. So first, I'm going to consider parametric optimization. Of course, this is what we normally do. We find out what the certain costs are of, of different items or what the going rate is uh, for different products, and then we design a process around it. So in this case, um, what, is the, what is the current spot price for water and the spot price for gas, and what's the design that gives us the best, the best project economics? Of course, the problem with that is tomorrow those conditions, those market conditions change, and you, you know, we don't have the luxury of redesigning the process every time the market conditions shift. So um, you can see what the, uh, you know, going to the bank with this uh, this optimal design, you can see why that might be a challenge. I'm going to pause just to go into a more illustrative example before I um, before I go back to that that water example, simply because it's hard to visualize what, what's really at stake in the, in the water problem. The, the, the equations are something that you really can't visualize. But this will make it pretty clear um, about kind of what the, what the two-player game is, 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 is looking at. So I have a simple quadratic uh, problem here where uh, I have a, a person, an opponent, for instance, choosing a p-value, and then you need to solve an optimization problem given that p-value. So in the full space, it looks like this weird thing. It's just essentially an upside-down parabola that's sheared in the p direction. Um, and the projection of that in the uh, x and f plane uh, looks like this for the various uh, p values. So I, from p equals minus 2 in red to p equals positive 2 in blue. Um, then the optimal solution, so your opponent chooses a p value. Now you get to optimize along that, uh, along that parabola. So if the, if the p-value is positive 2, your optimal value is there. And then, uh, of course, uh, 
they all lie on the on the apex here. And uh, the line between those optimal points um, is essentially this function, and it happens to be a continuous function here. So we want to take this a step further, of course, for robust optimization or this worst case feasibility, and we need to find we need to find the p-value that's the the worst condition for you. So your opponent is really um, trying to find out, you know, their their objective is trying to find that p-value that that you have to respond to. It's going to be the worst p-value. And then your response is, of course, to try and be the best in in that case. So what we do is we formulate the min-max problem. So, uh, again, this is the same problem as before, uh, but now we've added this minimization out front. So we have a two-player game. Uh, Your opponent is choosing first. Um, Their objective is, again, to push these parabolas into the negative direction as far as possible. And then you are trying to essentially climb up your parabola and hopefully try and get back into, uh, you know, maybe back into the positive region here. Uh, it's easy to visualize what the solution of this problem is because, it, it, you know, just how simple it is. Um, the optimal solution actually lies here. Uh, you can see that that's as far as we can go in the, in the negative direction um, in, the parameter, in the parameter dimension. And then, of course, uh, we always, uh, the optimal solution of this inner problem is at the apex here. But it's not, not that clear for kind of a general min-max problem where you can't very easily visualize this. So let's go back to the parametric optimization problem. We have, again, um, someone choosing your market conditions, and you're trying to find the design that gives you the best economics. And we formulate the min-max problem. So now we're seeking out the worst uh, market conditions. And your response, which, again, you have to take it to the bank, is to find the design that gives you the best economic performance. So how do we solve that problem? In the general case, the min-max problem is um, its not easy to solve. It's, it's in, incredibly difficult and in many cases intractable. So what do we do? Um, I'm going to reformulate this problem into an equivalent problem that's easier to solve. And when I do that, the solution of that easier problem corresponds to the solution of the min-max problem, the tougher problem that I can't solve. And the problem, that I, the, the problem structure that I'm going to be reformulating uh, to is called a semi-infinite program. Um, the semi-infinite program is, looks actually quite a lot like a, a standard optimization problem. The only difference is that uh, the constraint here is indexed by a real number, and that real number can take an infinite man, uh, infinitely many values from an interval. So this constraint is actually... Uh, It's nice and compact here, but there's actually infinitely many uh, constraints in this case. That's where the infinite comes from. Um, Now, that might seem like a bad idea to formulate something that seems so simple into something that has infinite in the name. Um, But this is, uh, you have to bear with me, this is actually uh, easier to solve. I've worked on a lot of Ethereum algorithms for doing that, so I'm very comfortable working in semi-infinite programs. So that's the that's the direction I took to solve the, the min-max problem. So first step is we formulate uh, go from the min-max problem to a bi-level problem here. So these are equivalent, um, and then we reformulate this inner program as a semi-infinite constraint. And now we're in the form of a semi-infinite program, and I can solve that, and I'll get the the solution I showed before. And that's exactly what we're going to do for the for the design problem at stake here. Um, this is the this is the min max problem reformulated as a semi infinite program, but I've in- introduced some compact notation now where uh, p is just going to represent the, um, the 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 pricing, the market conditions, and then d are, are the design variables. What's really awesome about this is that this is a it's a decision problem. The optimal solution eta star um, tells you whether or not this is economically viable. Uh, if eta star is greater than zero, this tells you you have robust feasibility. So you have a potentially economically viable uh, uh, answer or solution or project in the face of those worst case market conditions. If it's less than zero, it tells you that's not the case. So you really need to go back to the, the drawing board and begin redesigning your, your system. If it equals zero, I say further analysis is required. Uh, that's not a great decision, but... Of course, computers have round-off error, 
And uh, because you need to solve this to global optimality, you're often, you're often bounding things within some round-off error. And uh, if it equals zero, well, for this case, <laughs> if the net present value is very near zero, you could probably argue that's not a great investment anyways. Um, however, in the general case, if it equals zero, it, we don't actually know if it's above or below zero by, by some margin. So feasibility, uh, worst case feasibility, is, is still uh, at large. So that's the, that's the ultimate goal, is to solve this problem. But I want to go back to the parametric optimization problem for a little bit because it really helps you, it really helps you see the, the performance for different parameter values. And then when we solve the, the worst case design problem, the semi-infinite program, then you know, uh, you know for sure what the answer is. Uh, what's really neat here is what I'm showing is, is the energy consumption of the process in red and in blue, the blue bars are the, is the energy that's supplied by solar. So for $6 gas, we only supply, on an annual average, 30% of all the energy that the process consumes. What's really amazing is that when we have $7 gas, we nearly double that appetite for solar. So there's a very high sensitivity when gas prices are, are quite low. You know that if gas prices are too low, the capital investment is not warranted. And, you know, if without placing a cost on the environmental aspects of gas, uh, you can't make an economic argument. However, as they start to get more expensive, you have a greater appetite for solar. That's natural. Uh, however, you can see we don't actually increase a whole, mo- a, ho- a whole lot as we go from $7 to $8 to $9 gas. We go just up a, a tiny fraction. Um, the reason for that is that goes back to the solar resource conditions, where we actually have a lot of uh, great solar in the summer and not a lot in the winter. So when you model it out and you start to get these annual averages, there's diminishing returns. And it really comes down to the fact that you're creating a very large solar array for the design, and all of that energy is going to waste in the summertime. You can't actually capture that and store it seasonally. And the waste is the difference between the blue bar and this blue line. So you can see in the in, the, in this design here, uh, there's quite a lot of waste. The project economics are, are shown here uh, for these uh, three different parameter values for the water contract price. And then uh, the gas prices are these columns. The net present value are the bars. And then for the economists that are out there, I have also included the IRR, just so you can see how the, the different performance metrics stack up. Um, What's, of course, amazing about this, someone who's a a major proponent of renewable energy, is that in every case, the project that has some fraction of renewable energy is always better than the project that that doesn't. Um, So the natural gas only case is not nearly as as economically viable. Also, that there is a number of conditions where the the natural gas projects are not not economically viable at all. So the net present values are are deeply into the negative. Um, So... This is kind of illustrative over, over the behavior of the model and the behavior of the optimization problems, but it doesn't tell us with, with any kind of rigor um, whether or not we can come up with a worst-case design. Um, so now I solved that problem. I solved the semi-infinite program to global optimality, and, uh, and it gave us an answer that we were looking for. That answer identified this uh, these economic conditions as the worst economic conditions, the water contract price at $1,800 and the water price, or sorry, the gas price at $9. That's kind of intuitive. Um, but it also identified uh, the optimal design, which corresponded to how large of a solar array you needed um, and, and storage. And then uh, um, what's really amazing is that because it, we implement solar, we're actually robust to those market conditions. Look at the difference between uh, the net present value for the solar case and the gas only case. Um, so this is this is awesome. We sit, basically said renewables uh, renewables at this capacity enables the projects for the worst case economics, which are which are uh, realizable. So uh, we have a feasible design. What that feasible design looks like uh, is here. We have roughly our hundred thousand acres. Uh, farmland, this whole growing region. We currently have 6,000 acres of impaired land set aside. By 2035, we'll grow to more than double that. Um, And if we implement solar, we'll actually sustain uh, 
sustain this uh, land outside of the agricultural region at about half of what the current drainage region is. And that also accounts for inefficiencies in the, in the drainage uh, infrastructure. So the, the quick conclusion is that the worst case economics support investment in solar desalination. Uh, of course, that was, the, that was the answer we were looking for. So solar desalination for sustainable agribusiness, this actually makes economic sense. Um, on its own, desalinated water is considered too expensive by farmers. So when we show up and say, we can treat this water and we'll sell it back to you and you know, you'll have some new water, um, they balk at that. There's no way that they, 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 could, they claim to be able to afford that. However, because you take the, the, the systems level approach and have a systems view solution with this optimal design methodology, we can propose this to a farming, uh, a farming operation and show that this makes economic sense for investment. Uh, and lastly, these results provide further support for the capital investment versus uncertain futures argument. So do we pay now for renewables or do we risk energy, energy market volatility? This is an ongoing, this is an ongoing argument uh, in finance. Can you build a plant that needs natural gas and finance that natural gas today for 20 years uh, or, which you can't, banks are not going to finance your natural gas for 20 years, um, or do you invest in renewables? And renewables are, 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 are kind of showing that uh, de-risking of the investment. So some brief pictures of the, the, the pilot plant. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and, of course, answer any questions that, that you might have. Some questions? Sure. Uh, thanks for your talk. I mean, so you're taking a 1960s <laughs> era technology. The 1890s, let's... <laughs> 1890s. And, you're, and you're hybridizing it with this really fancy steam ejector absorber desorber thing. Yeah, right. You're very, you were very vague on the details of that. Of that device is that proprietary? Can you talk about the about the fluids that you're using? I can talk about it. Sure, sure. So, um, um, one of the things that about the startup is that we we have a very open source spirit. Um, so I do publish on on this topic. Uh, the the absorbent inside there inside the the absorber desorber system is um, it's an alkaline nitrate chemistry. So there's there's a potassium nitrate, lithium nitrate, and sodium nitrate. And um, it's at a very high concentration, so it's probably 65% by mass in the, in the absorber is, is the actual uh, absorbent chemistry, those salts. And then in the desorber, we might have 75 to 80% by mass, but it's at a very high temperature, so everything um, actually stays in solution. So steam absorption is the exothermic process? Or steam absorption is exothermic, and then endothermic is the desorption process. So you're not getting any heat from the actual, the actual heat of absorption or desorption. You're actually, you're actually just getting... You have to add in the, the high-temperature heat like you would a steam ejector to make that work. Sure. So you, you still have to add heat to transform back into a gaseous state. Um, but the overall process... The overall process gives you kind of a one-two boost. So for every one unit of energy that you need to put in from an external source, you're getting two units of steam out. And I think you can realize, you know, kind of visualize that because you're absorbing the steam, you're adding the energy, and then what's coming out the other end is the two units. So um, instead of just wasting it to the environment and getting a one-to-one, -one, you're getting a two-to-one. Yeah. So what's your typical recovery for a system like that? You mentioned high recovery, but most yeah. MED systems are not known for their high recovery. That's right. That's right. So most MED systems, and, and this is why I also didn't talk about flash, um, they're really focused on seawater applications. And you don't want to have high recovery for a couple of reasons, operational issues, but also you're rejecting it. You're rejecting your brine to the environment. And if you have very high salt loads, you'll, you'll kill fish and all this stuff. Um, our system is not a typical MED, so it's a it's a it's a plate and frame system, and so we're not actually we don't have spray nozzles that get clogged up with salt crystals. We actually have really really high velocity uh, heat exchange, and no boiling happens at the heat exchange interface. It all happens separately, so it's it's separating out the distillation process as a heat transfer and flash process, and so we can go. What comes out the back end? Um, what comes out the back end is a salt slurry. So depending on what the, 
what comes in the front. This could be 90 to 95% recovery um, just through this process. And then a final drying step to finish it off. But you still have sparingly soluble salts in the water that are retrograde solubility. Mm -hmm. you, you still have, I'm guessing, some calcium sulfate. Yep. A lot of, a lot of yep. Yeah, not, sure not a lot of silica, but calcium sulfate is the is the big one. And that will that will cake up your free exchange services really fast. They do, they do. So uh, we have two things to control it. We have um, we have of course the antiscalant, which which really helps. Um, some pH adjustment. Um, the high velocity really helps. So we're forming crystals more in situ rather than on heat transfer surfaces, um, because of just how the pressure happens in the in the heat exchange channels. Uh, or how pressure is distributed in the heat exchange channels, um, the high turbulence. Um, at the end of the day, after after operating um, after operating for about three months, we decided to open it up and see what we were looking at. Of course, we do have scale, um, but it was readily dissolvable uh, with a, a quick dose of hydrochloric acid. Uh, so this is online kind of in situ cleaning. So we just go to full recycle. You know, pumps run it out, and then we just open it up, and it's and it's good to go. And so you can see a full recovery of the of the heat transfer coefficient, um, which is which is your, nice. Your brine discharge TDS is about what? Is about, like, you look at you talking two hundred thousand, or you talking? Yeah. So it, it yeah. So uh, in this case, in this case, the primary salt is sodium sulfate, um, which has quite high solubility, a bit higher than sodium chloride. But yeah, we're pushing. We can push uh, the two hundred thousand mark, and uh, and even beyond because as, as soon, like I said, as soon as it comes out, we're seeing uh, we're seeing a lot of salts forming uh, crystals already, and then as it cools down, we just form a giant cake. <laughs> it's just um, seeding out. Yeah. I'll let someone else ask. <laughs> sure. So hi, Mike. Thank you for your uh, talk. So the first uh, design that you saw was um, to have just a compressor there. Right? Yeah, yeah, kind of a, a mechanical compression. Right. So what? But I don't think I didn't understand that uh, quite well. Your design. Why don't you put a turbine after the compressor? So you take the low pressure steam, yeah, the high pressure steam. Why don't you just put a Turbine there, make something like a runtime cycle. Yeah. Get some electricity, which most likely will be higher than the electricity that you will put on the compressor. And uh, how would this system be compared with what you are proposing? Yeah. So I think this is related to uh, the Brayton cycle. You kind of have a yeah some turbine putting the shaft work over. Mm -hmm. um, so I've I've investigated that. Uh, it's certainly an opportunity. So as a one thing that's challenging about it is the operating conditions. Um, certainly, uh, fluctuations in pressures and temperatures shift, uh, you know, shift the requirement of the compressor quite a lot. And then, uh, you know, on a coupled turbine, that becomes a, uh, another issue. Um, then, how do we power the turbine? Um, from what steam source um, should we do that? Uh, you might propose, you know, powering it with the, the low pressure low pressure steam or, or um, some other adjacent steam source. Um, this is, this low pressure steam is actually quite stagnant. Um, it's, it's very, very low quality. It's like 35 degrees Celsius. So uh, we're talking, yeah, we're talking deep vacuum, you know, pretty deep vacuums. Um, so it's not really going to be a driver of a, of a turbine. Um, but we could produce steam using the solar, excuse me, and, um, and kind of do the same thing. So instead of adding electricity, you have some kind of other mechanical <laughs> process do it. And they do this actually in tomato processing. They basically have a giant steam generator, um, and uh, it, it's actually from boiling, um, boiling all the tomatoes, produces all of this steam. They do it at some <laughs> condition, and then they try and capture the energy that in, that's in that steam through some kind of a, a ranking or Brayton cycle. Um, that's, that adds quite a lot of cost. To this process, we're already kind of up at the limit of what uh, what there is an appetite for water already, and uh, adding a turbine and a compressor is a is a you know an additive issue to that. Then the last bit is uh, if you are going to be generating steam to power a turbine for doing this compression, uh, do you do that with? 
concentrated solar thermal energy or some um, maybe some biomass combustion or something like that. Uh, and then you get down into the overall cycle efficiency. And what I argue, um, you know, especially through modeling and data, is that using the, using the thermal energy directly in this way um, is actually much more efficient from a thermodynamic perspective. Um, it's much more efficient use of capital. And although you don't get quite as high of overall efficiency as you do with a mechanical compressor, um, it, uh, it's, it leads to a more optimal solution for this application. And then, uh, um, you know, the big, thing, the big thing that I'm trying to overcome, of course, is, is trying to minimize what, what, you know, what the cost of the, the renewables are. And so um, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. It actually relates back to how there's the argument of do you use concentrated solar thermal energy for power generation or do you use it strictly for process heat applications? And a lot of people in industry are in total agreement that for power generation, concentrated solar thermal is not, is not great. And uh, we're, we're trying to overcome challenges in that, but PV has totally pretty much killed that whole, that whole thing. But for process heat, we're really... Uh, really excited about it. And, and another question, maybe a silly question. Why, don't you, why do you try to find the worst case feasibility and not the best case feasibility? So worst, yeah, yeah. So worst case feasibility, what I'm trying to do is, is really identify what those market conditions are that make it the most difficult for us to have an economically viable project. And the reason why that's important is because I'm already going to uh, financing sources that are so risk averse that I can't say the best case feasibility. I can't say, oh, guess what? If gas price is two dollars and you know water is a million dollars, you know what I mean? The, of course, those market conditions are going to give you the best the the, the best solution, um, and that might make me rich right now, but that's not going to solve the problem. <laughs> so, yeah. the first time that I show someone to solve the optimized optimize the problem solving for worst case rather than the best case. Right. So yeah, it's it's a yeah, it might be slightly a misnomer too. It is it's seeking out the best case design for the worst case economics. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So um, regarding that worst case scenario, yep. right now farmers don't pay a lot for their water. Yeah, like almost lot, nothing. A mm -hmm. lot complex history of Mm -hmm. I hope you read Cadillac Desert. Um, <laughs> the uh, so I mean, you're, if you charge them anything, yep. How 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 are you going to convince them? That's right. You're also taking 2.5 percent of their land to cover a thousand acres of a 2.2 acre fee. Right. And so you're going to take 25 acres to put your system up to to provide irrigation for a thousand acres. I mean, this is, these are a lot of costs. Yeah. Yeah. So how can you justify this? Are these, are these built into your model? Can you give us like a range of where your cost might be relative to what they pay now? Yeah. So um, so with these water contract prices, that that was that was part of that whole part of the argument over kind of why the systems level approach is is so important. And it really is because the farmers don't have an appetite to pay anything for water. However, their water districts will go to the spot market and they'll pay three or four thousand dollars an acre feet for water. And that's just, it's an, it's an uncertain thing. So if they don't have water, if they have water, they pay nothing. If they don't have water, they're, they're fully happy going to the spot market and paying, you know, exponentially more than they ever would, right? So their water budget is very, very flexible. But what's neat about this design is that I'm not charging the farmers. I'm actually generating a credit for putting it back into the water system for downstream use. So LADWP now has an extra acre foot of water because, because that wasn't used in the farming sector. Well, it was, but the farmers generated that, right? How much, Joel, how, how much does LADWP pay for that per acre? It depends. So I was asked this on the radio, and I had to come up with a quick answer. Um, but there's a few, a few reports that have, have pegged it between uh, 1,500 and 2,500, depending, uh, depending on the time of year and the, and the drought conditions. Um, we do know that that Carlsbad, for instance, you know, they, they brought the, the RO plant online. Um, we know that their pain is it's about twenty three hundred dollars an acre foot. Okay. 
Um, so we kind of have an idea of what those market conditions are for the municipal uses. And so now we're making farmers, uh, we're incentivizing farmers to recycle and conserve, and, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's another revenue stream along with their, their, their regular products. It's something that they understand. They know how to trade water, but they don't know how to generate revenue off water because water doesn't have that value to them. But you're reliant on a regulatory environment that, that, that promotes that kind of system as well as, as, a, as a charging of water that's very high. You're reliant on that high water price at the, at the municipal level to make that kind of model work. A little bit, yeah. And some of that, I mean, a lot of that is driven by is driven by uh, lack of resources, right? So in the drought conditions, it, this all this does all make sense. But in the same way that Carlsbad said, we need a 30-year contract agreement from the city to have a minimum to cover our operating costs with some escalator that's going to make sense in 30 years. And they said, great, take our you know take our system, let's let's do it. And um, and that's what we're proposing is that you know we are looking for the sustainability of of the agribusiness for. Um, you know, for, for making that work. But back to the quick, quick deal about the land is that right now that region that I'm considering, that 100,000 acres, 6,000 of those acres are currently totally impaired. And uh, for, for instance, Westland's Water District, um, the federal government has said as part of this, this ongoing salt impairment issue, um, the Westland's Water District has been told they need to they need to give up about 400,000 acres of arable land and set it aside because it's, it's impaired. And it's basically going to be a dumping ground um, for, for the rest of their agriculture. So to sustain, you know, quote unquote sustain, to keep operating, you need to continually set aside land that you can dump all of this stuff on. And so that growth pattern of 6,000 acres today to 15,000 acres in 10 years or in 20 years, um, you know, those are, those are real numbers. But today we could implement it, and now it's only 3,000 acres. And in 20 years, it's only going to be 3,000 acres. So that's, a, that's where the added value is, is in, in the crop revenues as well. So um, shifting gears a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious, when you, when you originally came up with your optimization problem, you said that you know, it's pretty challenging and at times it can become uh, uh, intractable. Yeah, so yeah. You go to your semi, semi-infinite programming approach. Can that deal with the intractable problems too, or, or will that run into a roadblock there also if, if the original problem is intractable? Again? Yeah, so if the, if the min-max problem is intractable, um, the semi-infinite program um, can actually get around that. So yeah, if the in the I mean most of the min max problems are are intractable. There's just not you know you kind of need very certain convexity assumptions or linearity, um, which I showed you. I kind of had this right very easy concave and a very linear, and we can visualize that. Um, but as soon as you start throwing in anything truly nasty, like we see in processes or in systems, um, you know that all goes out the window, right? You can't make those assumptions anymore, and you need global optimization. <coughs> Now, what is the global optimization algorithm for a min-max problem? Um, well, we know we know what it can do for the semi-infinite program, and so in that framework, it, it's actually quite a lot easier to solve. Um, and then those solutions correspond. So that kind of leads me to my second question: um, Do you really need global optima? I mean, it seems like you really want to get eta um, at present value to be greater than zero. Yeah. So if you can just show that that's greater than zero, haven't you at least made the case to um, your investors or whoever that you know. You yeah, that's a that's a really good observation. Actually, um, one modification of my algorithm was to stop once you get that that certification. So, although some parts of the algorithms require global optimization, you don't need the global optimum to get the answer. But also, you don't want to go to the bank with a design that's overly conservative. Once you have the answer, you might have an overly conservative design, and the economics may not be as good as they should. And so, you know, that, that's, that's where the global optimum may, may be beneficial. Uh, yeah, definitely see. I mean, obviously, if you can get the global optimum. Yeah, yeah. Right? I just think more of the cases where you can't necessarily get the global optimum, but you can yep. show your data is greater than zero. Right. So, yeah, the algorithm does rely on being able to find the global optimum because it's a, it's a, like a constraint qualification problem. So you do need to have at some stage, um, 
a rigorous guarantee um, that you haven't violated constraints. Um, and the global optima is required there. But you're right, for the overall problem, if all you're looking for is that binary yes or no, yeah. once you got it, you're done. Um, and that's, that's a, another class of problems that I, I, I've worked on. Um, but here what's really cool is that once you, def once you get that eta star, and it is the global optimum, it corresponds to both the worst case market conditions. So that tells you something about your ec the, 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 the kind of the decision of your problem, the economics of your problem. It also tells you the design of your problem. So, or, you know, what your project is going to look like. And now you, can, now you can take that to your contractor and start designing the system. So it tells you quite a lot of information that, that otherwise you wouldn't have. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Um, so you are solving an optimization problem, but uh, so shifting gears more. Uh, you talked about robust design also. Right? right. So what are you robust against? What parameters or inputs? And what are your robustness metrics? So. When I say robust design, I'm, I'm saying I'm coming up with a design um, that's robust to the uncertainty in, in this case, the uh, market conditions. The market conditions would be the, um, would be the, the water price and the, the gas price for, the, for this example. So these are things that are fluctuating on a daily basis. And what we need to find is a design that's robust to those fluctuations, so one that, one that works in the in the event of, of you know, unfavorable fluctuations. Have you done that for the worst case? Yeah, so in this case, um, you know, because I, I, I'm, I'm working on this, uh, this formulation, I, that, that's exactly it. I'm seeking out a design uh, that's robust in the worst case or, or feasible in the worst case. And the idea is um, there isn't some kind of a stochastic qualification or anything like that. Um, that says there's some probability of these market conditions happening. I really am seeking out what happens if the if the black swan shows up. And in that case, I, I it really is about can I find a design? And if you can, that's great. Let's continue to pursue the project. Let's build on that. Uh, so, what is the, the model that goes into the optimization? What are you designing? Are you designing the plant or? So the, the core of the water treatment technology was designed and optimized um, kind of uh, aside. So this was the first, the first stage of the design, which wasn't considered in, in, in this talk. Um, and really what it was about was all the heat integration. Why I chose the desorption absorption process, why MED is great, why, the, why I chose concentrated solar thermal in the form of parabolic trough. Um, all, of that, all of that has a thermodynamic argument to it. So that, that's one system that was, that was kind of fixed. But what wasn't fixed in this case was um, what can we give up from the agricultural region in terms of land space that you would put a solar array on, that you would put a water treatment technology out on? Um, what are the economics of that, of that system? And it's you know, water sales or tomato sales or, um, or the, the cost of salt impairment all of those economics, and what are you offsetting? If you put a solar array down, you can't generate tomatoes, but you might be saving some future retirement of land. So the optimal design in this case was really about um, what size solar array you would want to power your water treatment technology, and what would that look like um, in, the, in the perspective of overall sustainability for that, that agricultural region. And the idea is that you're going to be designing this on day zero, going to the bank, and then, um, and then beginning to build it out. So you have some form of correlation of the footprint of the plant? So that, yeah, that's actually a, that's actually a, a first principles model. So the, the array itself, the array itself, the, the characteristics of the array um, was all modeled out. And then um, um, what you do with that model, you have the, the data input from the solar resource, and once you have that, you have all of the angles, all of the, you know, all of the heat transfer, everything going on. You know exactly the performance of, that, of the solar array for that given region, even the tracking. Um, now you, have, you also have storage. And then you relate that to the, the energy consumption of the plant. Um, and then you wrap an optimization problem around that, the semi-infinite program, which says, you know, 
how many of these arrays, given this performance um, for a given year, it's going to take. Okay, so didn't the bank ask about the uncertainty of the model itself? So how well does the, how well does the solar array model predict? Yeah, and that's part of our piloting project. So we put a, right, we put a solar array out there. Uh, we ran it a bunch. We figured out the solar conditions and what the performance of this is. And then you get, you know, you actually get um, um, engineering uh, insurance companies that give a certificate on that. So they'll say, this array guarantees this performance. Um, you know, these are, the, these are the model characteristics that perform, you know, at this performance. And, um, and they give you that guarantee in the bank, basically. You know, they're, they're, the, they're the, the backstoppers of that. The bank just checks off. If you knew the uncertainty of the model, would you include it with the uncertainty of the price of the water and the gas as another one for which you have to... Design yeah, robustly. yeah, you could. So yeah, that that gets into the, yeah, kind of model structure uncertainty in the parameters, um, and there and there's a number there's a number of uncertainty sources that we could incorporate to kind of really blow this out, um, and and consider. Um, of course, the more you add, kind of a little bit less illustrative it becomes, um, but certainly all of that can be taken into account. And it's it's fairly easy once the model is developed. So what was the size of the model? Like how many how many variables? Well, so yeah, you have discrete inputs of the eighty seven sixty data format. Um, so the overall, yeah, it's <laughs> a good question. How the how the model um, how the outputs actually go through the intermediate variables? You know, it's probably what the global optimizer sees. Of course, would just be um, would just be these these couple of variables, like four, but the actual, the actual model is, is definitely going to be uh, in, the, in the thousands range. Just simply because you have performance over the hours, and those are very discrete, uh, discrete phenomena. Are we at the point that we solve by level problem with a thousand variables? <laughs> uh, I don't when, when I'll stake my claim on that. <laughs> solve the min-max problem, yeah, generally non-convex, the global optimality with, uh, yeah. Thousand or so variables. <laughs> okay. I think we're over time, so thank you very All much. Right. Cheers. Thank you.